Yeah, so Yari, could you just provide a brief introduction to who Suravardi was, and as well as maybe the 12th century uh, philosophical scene he was working in? Sure. So, so, so Shabbatin Suravardi is a philosopher and a rather controversial public figure who was active in the in the latter half of the 12th century common era. Uh, his complete historical figure is is complex and and, and to some extent. The, the complexity is added by the fact that, that, that we don't really know that much of the details of his life. Uh, but it seems that in addition to being active in philosophy, he, he, he had some aspirations in the occult science and possibly also in politics. Some of this may have, may have had to, may have been in the background of, of, his, uh, of his death as well. But, but again, we don't really know enough details to be sure. Uh, he died quite young. He was uh, either executed or, 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 or incarcerated and then died in prison at around the age of 40 uh, in, 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 in what most scholars agree was in the year 1191 common era. But despite his early death, he left a fairly considerable body of work. Uh, having said that, it's quite clear that, that, that his career was cut in, in an ascent uh, and, and, and you know, there's a there's a lot of um, it seems like there's a lot of ideas that he was in the process of developing and couldn't couldn't quite finish, which leaves some of his most interesting and most original ideas rather sketchy, and particularly this 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 work that's that was my one of my main sources, the Hikmatul Ishraq, which is basically the only comprehensive, uh, well, still still sketchy and fairly short, but it's still it, it nevertheless. Uh, Tries to give a comprehensive account of his uh, of his alternative philo philosophical system, the so-called illuminationist system, and it's a very sort of concise work. And it's clear that many ideas are only presented in a nutshell, and and, and he would have probably liked to uh, elaborate on them, given given uh, the occasion. Now, this this is partly frustrating. We don't really, I mean, we only have so much text. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, it's it's somewhat liberating because it gives gives um, uh, uh, scholars like me who have strong sort of aspirations in terms of reconstructing people's people's thought. It gives us a, a, a lot of sort of free room, uh, and it's I mean the frustration is also given by the fact that in addition to to this book Hikmat ul Ishraq, we have we have several hundred hundreds of pages of of uh, philosophical writing by Suhravarti, where he engages with uh, with other sort of alternatives of, of, of philosophical thinking available in his time, and particularly with with, uh, with the thought of of Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, um, the early 11th century author who really provides most of the most of the sort of the background and, and the foundation for for the for the debate in the in the 12th century. So. Um, in the book, I'm trying to use this this sort of critical reception of Avicenna, in which Suhrawar is very much a key player, to to also make sense of the of the sketchy account of his positive philosophy, or, the, or his positive alternative system. Um, so I'm sort of trying to read these books books in tandem. So that's that's basically about Suhrawar. The the 12th century at large, I would say, uh, is a is a, is a sort of a very vigorous intellectual landscape, it's especially in the eastern part of the Islamic world. Uh, and at this time, many thinkers with various approaches sort of engage in the, in the, in the joint attempt at making sense of, of, of Avicenna's philosophy and assessing its, its merits, both on its, on, in terms of its, in terms of Avicennian system on its own, and then in terms of its sort of theological applicability. The interests of of of, of uh, the particular interests of different thinkers, different readers of Avicenna vary, but but the 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 most important thing is that they're all sort of engaged in the same attempt of of making sense and 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 uh, coming to terms with with his philosophical heritage. Some were perhaps more interested in the question of how Avicenna fares against uh, Abu Hamid Ghazali's uh, critique of his philosophy. Ghazali is a is a is a is a theologian who lived at the turn of the 11th and, and 12th century and and, and uh, was partly responsible of integrating much of 
uh, Avicenna's philosophy to theology, but also uh, was very critical of it. I guess you, you, you're probably many of you are probably aware of his work, uh, *The Half of Philosophy*, which is a which is a long, sort of point by point uh, critique and and often very very perspicacious critique of Avicenna's philosophy. So help, that sort of uh, challenge that Ghazali left is is one sort of factor that 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 preoccupied people. Others were perhaps more concerned with questions emerging from within the Abyssinian tradition, and especially here, as they were prodded by, by, by the highly original thinker Abu Barakat al-Baghdadi, who was active in the first half of the, of the 12th century. Uh, and so, like I said, thinkers with very different motivations uh, engaged with this material, and they engaged with each other. Uh, they, they, were, they, they were sharing a common discussion, so, so and, and what is what is more, the doctrinal positions that would be settled later were at this stage still largely unsettled. So it was a lots of ideas were in the air. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the doctrinal position hadn't yet sort of hardened into into anything very stable. So it's an extremely interesting period for for a historian of philosophy. And if you're interested in reading more, there's a very very recent book by by Frank Griffel. I think it's called The Formation of Post Classical Philosophy in Islam, which Focuses on precisely this this century from a number of different different aspects. I think it's a it's a wonderful work, and uh, I wish it had been available when I was was writing the book, so I could have made proper use of it. But 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 I I, I wholeheartedly recommend that book to everyone interested in this this uh, historical period. Cool, cool. Just curious, um, when you talk about the doctrinal developments after, were those? Developments kind to Sorabari, or was it kind of like a lot of his philosophy was considered inconsistent? Yeah, there there there, there does emerge uh, sort of an illuminationist school of philosophy. I don't think it it ever becomes uh, really mainstream, but it's still there's a there's a certain textual tradition. People uh, comment on on, on Sorabari's works, and I guess some people identify them th themselves Iraqi. Now it does become actually quite impactful in later Iranian philosophy. Uh, this is particularly in the 17th century, in the in the in the Safavid period, uh, when uh, people like Mullah Sadr, Sadr Din Shirazi, or Mullah Sadra, uh, sort of okay. Well, he, he's he's the most important figure here. He 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 presents again claims to present a new new sort of philosophical system, but. But in doing so, actually borrows a lot from Suhrawardi and, and, and uses many Suhrawardian ideas. And as we know uh, today, uh, or well, since then, and, and, and including today, down, down to today, Mullah Sadr's philosophy has really been sort of central uh, in, in, in the Iranian tradition, so far so that, that when we look at the uh, sort of the official ideology of the Islamic Republic of Iran, it's it's very much sort of I mean, Sadra is there, there, there at, at, at the roots, simply because his his philosophy is being taught in 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 the in the Shiite madrasas. So, in that sense, uh, I guess you could say that even even if Surawardi Surawardi's philosophy never really becomes sort of a um, it never becomes mainstream. There is a tradition, and then in certain parts of of, of the Islamic world, uh, it, it 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 really gains in importance, even even if there are very few people who sort of well, there are not that many people who would be sort of self about Sufrawardians or self about uh, uh, illuminationists, but the, but his influence is definitely there. One more thing, perhaps uh, in this regard, uh, the first commentaries on Sufrawardi's works are actually quite late. Well, not that late, but there's a, a, approximately a hundred years between between his death and the emergence of the first comment commentary on his works. So there's. What I'm what I'm trying to say is that there's no sort of immediate uh, uh, teacher disciple relationship between between him and his 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 commentators, which sort of uh, uh, I think the, the the commentaries are genuinely interesting and, and and I think to some extent they they provide us a, a, a good insights on how to interpret Suhrawardi, but at the same time, there's the feeling that they're definitely taking him in a in a certain direction, and that's not necessarily the direction that Suhrawardi was aiming aiming at by himself. So, so in that sense, the commentaries are also 
their interpretations like, I would say that their interpretations like any other interpretation, they're temporarily closer to Sudrawati, but there's, they're, they're also separated by a considerable gap of time. And by the, by, by the end of the 13th century, where the first commentaries appear, the intellectual landscape is already quite different from what it was when, when Sudrawati was writing. Interesting. Yeah, and that kind of leads into my next question, which was, I mean, so were these commentary, the initial commentaries, um, were they, did they kind of emphasize Sorovardi as a mystical thinker? Because basically you, you kind of describe there's a division in scholarly approaches to Sorovardi. And some people take a more mystical approach like uh, Henry Corbon, whereas you take a more rash, uh, philosophical anti-mystical approach to his system. So could you kind of describe those, that kind of scholarly uh, division a bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think it's true that, that, that um, at least some of these earliest commentators, they, they, uh, they seize on certain aspects in Suhrawati that are definitely there. I'm not, I don't want to, want to uh, deny that, but they, 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 by elaborating on them, by giving giving them by, by sort of amplifying them, they I would say that they are quite they have a fairly strong responsibility in making those aspects part of a central part of the illuminationist tradition. They're there in Sutravati, but I would say that they're not quite as pronounced as as as, the, as some of these comment, commentators, particularly an early figure named Shamsuti Sharsuri. Uh, uh, he's I would say he's a he's a quite important key player in, the, in this regard, but yeah, uh, Corban is is a, I mean Corban was largely responsible for introducing Suhrawardi to to Western scholars. Scholars uh, there was some there were some studies before him, but but he he really we could say devoted much of his life work to 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 Suhrawardi and, and and among other things he he edited some of his main works and, and Corban's editions I I think are are. are <laughs> uniformly quite excellent, still still very much in use today. But Corbin had a very particular interpretation of him, so he of Suhrawadi. So he focused on his mystical ideas, but then he also presented Suhrawadi as a representative of this kind of perennial wisdom tradition, uh, which combined uh, Zoroastrian thought and and and, and then uh, certain uh, esoteric. Um, Approaches to Islam and, and 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 combine all of this into something something that should be, according to Corban, approached in a historical terms. So it's it's Corban de-emphasized the historical context and, and 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 wanted to point point out various uh, continuities, some of which for some of which there might be some evidence for others. There was hardly any evidence apart from the associations in Corbin's, Corbin's mind. Uh, so, 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 yeah, he, he in in this kind of reconstruction, the, the kind of philosophical virtues that 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 I want to emphasize: rational argumentation, conceptual clarity, systematic analysis. They're clearly secondary in importance, and I think they're. I mean, it's absolutely clear; should be clear to anyone. Uh, who is critically reading Corbin that there are serious methodological problems in his approach. I mean, can still can make. I think his his, his works are uh, engaging to read, uh, yeah. sometimes quite 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 exciting. But 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 if you look, for instance, at the uh, at some of the remarks that he makes in the uh, uh, in the in the second part of his series on Islam Irania, which is devoted to Suhrawati, he's basically saying that that the, the proper way to study Suhrawati is to ascend to what what uh, what he called what Corban and Suhrawati call this uh, world of imagination, and and making these associative connections there, completely dis disregarding historical connections and, and 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 whether there would have been whether whether for instance certain ideas would have been available to Suhrawati through texts. Or through oral sources, and I think, I mean, no serious scholar could yeah. could could accept that kind of approach. But still, many many uh, scholars have, have followed Corbin, and I think because of that, Sukhrabadi has acquired a reputation as a as a thinker who, insofar as he engages with with philosophy, he he does so mostly in order to develop these ideas in a in a mystical framework. And I think one of the problems. 
not to mention the fact that 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 we can actually challenge this kind of interpretation by looking closely at the text. One of the problems is is that 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 it tends to make Sukhravati, but also a large part of of, of the later Islamic philosophical tradition. Uh, Insofar as it makes this tradition mystical, I think it it it, it does a disservice to it by by sort of making it seems seem less interesting for for serious scholars of for serious historians of philosophy, and, and thereby I mean you you it's it's a sort of an orientalist uh, move you you sort of exoticize the the Islamic tradition and 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 make it appear as something quite different from what we call philosophy, which is. I mean, even if it were done with good intentions, I think it ultimately has uh, unwanted outcomes. Uh, now, as I said earlier, I, I, I don't want to deny that there is a mystical aspect of Suhravati, and he, he himself is explicit about that. He Time and again, he says that the highest kind of knowledge that a person can have amounts to what, what, what we can only call some kind of mystical knowledge, whatever, whatever it means, but it's, it's something that's superior to, to, to our rational reasoning. But still, when we look at his corpus as a whole, in purely statistical terms, I think it's undeniable that most of it consists in very painstaking sort of philosophical analysis and argumentation. And in this work, mystical ideas play hardly any role. Or if, if they do, if they enter the picture, they're usually, you know, after a long series of ar argumentation, then he says, oh, by the way, these and these uh, Zoroastrian sages or Greek sages all also thought in this way. So what I'm trying to say, he very seldom justifies his philosophical ideas by, by, by claims to, to, to the authority of any kind of mystical knowledge or, or special revelation. And so I thought that it might be interesting to see whether his philosophy actually adds up and whether these whether this, this sort of philosophical uh, work that he devoted so much of his time to, the critique of Avicenna and the sketch of the positive alternative, whether they add up to something consistent. Uh, so that's basically uh, what, I, what I tried to do. I, obviously, I thought, thought that they do add up to something consistent. And I think Suhrawadi was also quite well aware of the border <coughs> between, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the sort of what we could call the mystical culmination of a person's life on the one hand, and then a sound and philosophically founded worldview on the other. And I wanted to reconstruct that the latter, the philosophical foundations of a worldview, uh, in a way that would make uh, his philosophy reconcilable with the idea of a mystical goal. Only that mystical goal is sort of uh, uh, comes after the philosophical work on the basis of a philosophical work. It's available for the philosopher, but it's not really part of his philosophy. One, uh, it's a long answer again. One last thing I would like to say is that I'm by no means the first uh, scholar to sort of criticize uh, Corbin and, and, and take this this uh, sort of a more philosophical or a systematic take on Suhrawardi. The late Jose Ziai, as well as his, his associate John Walbridge, both were doing, doing this kind of work long before me. Although Walbridge, at least, uh, possibly Ziai too, but Walbridge definitely wanted to uh, sort of take Suhrawardi's claims of this, this sort of perennial tradition at face value. Uh, I'm, I'm less inclined to do that, but 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 so there's a clear difference. Then Roxanne Marcotte, the uh, the Canadian scholar. Uh, has also been doing this kind of work. And then more recently, uh, there have been excellent studies on, uh, on, on that, that are trying to put Surawati in, in his immediate context, the 12th century, especially by Rob Wisnowski at McGill and, 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 and Fyodor Benevich now at, uh, at the University of Edinburgh. So in a way, it was a, it was a really good time to, to start doing this kind of work because, because the, the, the amount of, first of all, the amount of knowledge that one could re rely on was uh, considerably greater than it would have been, say, 20 years ago. And not only that, you would actually have colleagues with whom you could test ideas uh, instead of just developing them by yourself. And here, particularly, I would, I would like to recognize Fyodor Benevich as a sort of a uh, constant discussion partner over the years. It's, it's, it's very important for, for a scholar to be able to sort of test one's ideas. 
Yeah, and I was about to say, yeah, your, your um, discussion in the book, you discuss various interpretations of Benevich, and it's really, those are really exciting uh, portions of the book, I thought. Um, but yeah, so maybe we can dive um, with those preliminaries uh, um, done there. Maybe we can dive into uh, kind of the critical portion of Suravarti's magnum opus. So actually, um, your book, um, no, I think you could say half of it is kind of devoted to uh, uh, first four chapters, of it, devoted to Suravarti's critique of the Senate. And then um, the last four or so, four or five chapters are about illumination and it's the positive philosophy sort of right here. And, um, and, and then you mentioned you know, the, the first target that you bring up um, of Avicenna's system is Avicenna's understanding of real definition. So I wonder if we can maybe talk a little about that system of real definition. And, uh, um, yeah, so maybe could you provide kind of a, like a, a big picture sense of what is uh, Avicenna's idea of real definition and what role does it play in his kind of essentialist uh, theory of science? Right, yeah. So I guess we could say that, that the peripatetic theory of science uh, or that tradition to which, which Avicenna belongs to is, uh, in this, this theory, science is considered uh, as an axiomatic system. Uh, and in this system, real definitions play a crucial explanatory role. So a real definition is supposed to give us the, the, uh, the full set of the constitutive features of an essence, the essence that for which the definition is given. And once we know these, 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 these constitutive features, we can then explain various phenomena in, involving the entities that instantiate that essence. So once we know, uh, once we have a real definition of human being, we can then uh, explain a number of uh, regular, regularly occurring phenomena that have to do with human beings. So a textbook example is often is, I think it comes from all the way from Aristotle, is the, is the human capacity to laugh or the human risibility. And, and the idea is that we, should, we, we can ground this in the definition of human beings as rational animals. I think uh, in, in roughly the following ways. So first of all, animality involves corporeality. All animals are corporeal bodily entities. This means that they have a certain fixed spatial, well, not fixed, obviously they can move about in, in space, but, that, but they still have a definite spatial temporal position. So at any one time, they're in one place. And they're, they're, this means that, that, that any any animal is by necessity sort of epistemically epistemically limited by virtue of its determined spatial temporal position. So, for instance, it, by being by existing at one at a certain time, an animal cannot know the future, cannot cannot see into the future, and and and, and likewise by by being located in a by by looking at the world or perceiving the world from a particular particular spot, uh, it it it. it it only has a perspective to the world that is available from that spot. So, for instance, right now I can't see because the, my office door is closed. I can't see what's going on in the corridor simply because uh, I'm located here and I, I, I have no no access to to the corridor. So that's the animality part. It, there's a, a, a number of sort of features that 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 follow from it or that that are grounded in it. Rationality, on the other hand, involves uh, the capacity of 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 having universal knowledge and, and and furthermore the capacity of making predictions about things. Now, when we put these together, animality and rationality, they entail the capacity of being surprised, simply because we can make predictions about the future. But since we're epistemically limited, uh, that those predictions can be can be mistaken. So we have both the capacity for mistakes and the capacity for for predictions. And then laughter is is in in, in this view is just a physical counterpart of a certain type of surprise. When, we, when we're surprised in a certain way, we, we both burst out in laughter. So this would have been an, an example of how real definitions function in a, in, in, in a peripatetic science. And so in that sense, they are, they are really the starting points for any, any, any scientific explanation. If, if you don't have that, you don't really get, if you don't have them, you don't really get 
uh, peripatetic uh, science started. Now, having said all that, by Abyssinus time, and, and possibly quite a bit earlier, perhaps already in Aristotle, it's clear that, that this model was considered as a, as a sort of an ideal type, and that we, that we frequently fail to, 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 to have real definitions for things. Avicenna, interestingly, uh, in, in one of his posthumous works is, for some reason, he's, in, in, I mean, there's a number of uh, entries in that, in that posthumous work where he's very, very skeptical of our uh, capacity of knowing hardly any real definitions. He says that our definitions of, definition of human being is, is it's not the, the, the real definition. We're just focusing on some some sort of some perceivable features, like for instance, rationality or the capacity to speak. Speak. Uh, it's something that we uh, we we know that all humans are capable of doing that, but we don't know whether it's constitutive. Perhaps it's just a you know a concomitant feature of something something that is genuinely constitutive. And likewise, when it comes to our uh, definitions of the elements, the most basic kinds of uh, corporeal thing. For instance, when we define fire by by means of uh, as, as something that is uh, hot and dry, do we really know that that those are the constitutive features? Perhaps they are just the uh, the, the concomitant features uh, through which fire appears to uh, perceiving creatures like ourselves. So, so it's interesting that 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 some many of the sort of the skeptical. Uh, points that Suhrawardi makes are already anticipated in Avicenna, but there's in Avicenna there's a sort of a for want of a better word, let me say that it's is his theory of science is 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 in some somehow it's there's a certain amount of schizophrenia in it. He's very optimistic on the one hand when he's describing the ideal type, but then at some points he's 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 extremely pessimistic about our capacities of, of meeting that idea. Uh, and, 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 and clearly some of the 12th century figures, Suhrawardi included, seized on this discrepancy within Abyssin. Right. So, like you said, it, it sort of is kind of taking us, he's responding skeptically to the, this theory of science um, given by Abyssin. And I guess what we can get into a moment the notion of a more descriptive definition, which is, I think that's what we already think we can't have. <laughs> but um, maybe, maybe before we get into the kind of critique of real definition itself, that, that uh, so I've already, do you think we should look at the, um, the four characteristics that every real definition is supposed to have? You mentioned that it's kind of preliminary to Suravarti's critique of Avicenna. He says, you know, every real definition is supposed to be exhaustive, exclusive, has to have distinct metaphysical constituents, and then the definition is supposed to be more apparent or better known than the thing defined. So maybe briefly, can we kind of give a sense of, get a sense of what those four uh, features are? Right. So exhaustiveness, uh, that basically means that a real definition must include all the constitutive features of whatever, whatever it is that we're trying to define. Uh, and in particular, if we take the human, the human uh, continue with, stick, stick with that example, in addition to rationality and animality, that means that all the higher genera and differentiate that are included in the, in the sort of the, the porphyrian tree that begins from the from the from the highest genus and that then comes down to the lowest species. All of those must be included in the definition. And I sort of implicitly in my characterization of how real definitions function uh, in in explanation, scientific explanation, uh, I already implicitly hinted at this because I I mean by relying on corporeality as a constituent of higher constituent of of animality in the in the example so so so, so sometimes some some explain some features or phenomena that we want to explain may we might need to 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 appeal to some of the higher general higher differentiate to 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 make those explanations so for that reason it must be exhaustive the the definition must be exclusive so a real definition must hold of only one one and only one essence and I think that's we could basically say that that follows from from exhaustiveness. So if it includes all the uh, all the constitutive features, then then it can they can only hold of of, of one species. They sort of 
when when you put them together, you have that you have the species and and and, and only only one species. Uh, now the, the 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 demand for distinct constituents. Uh, so that the idea there is, in order to be true, the real definition must correspond to the essence that we're trying to define, and this means that since the definition has a certain structure. It, 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 I mean, it, the structure is basically the porphyrian tree of genera and differentiate that are, that, that are included uh, in the definition. It means in order to, in order for that structured proposition to correspond to the essence, the essence must have the same kind of uh, metaphysical structure, and that's why why, why so Rowdy thinks that 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 uh, in order to be valid, uh, the the reference of of real definitions must also have metaphysical structure. Now, this is an interesting point. I, 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 I plan to do some, some further research on this in the future because Avicenna actually himself notes uh, in, a, in a few places that, that, that uh, many of the things that Sukhravardi clearly thinks Avicenna held to be definable. Avicenna thinks that there are, for instance, uh, things like black and white, these species of colors, Avicenna thinks they're simple. There's no metaphysical structure to them. Now, if that's true, and if Avicenna held that, that in order for a real definition to be valid, its reference must, must have a, the same kind of structure as the definition, then Avicenna too would have held that those things are, are indefinable. I'm going to have to, in, in the future, I plan to have a look at, uh, okay, how much sort of uh, discussion of this fact, we, we, we find in Avicenna and how much uh, discussion there is between Avicenna and Suhrawardi in this regard, in, 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 in the logical text. But that's a, just wanted to note that, that, that that's actually, uh, how should I put it? It's not an innocent uh, observation that Suhrawardi makes there, because it's, this is one of, the, one of the key features in his uh, sort of metaphysical argument against real definitions, this 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 demand of of of, of metaphysical constitution in the in the essences that are being defined. Uh, finally, the, the 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 fourth criterion that the parts of the definition must be better known than the definition itself. So the idea here is, I think, that if the acquisition when we acquire a real definition, if the idea is that we thereby somehow increase our knowledge and the, the increase our knowledge is, is sort of well founded. It just doesn't emerge from somewhere, but it, it, we have reasons for for uh, subscribing to this new piece of knowledge. If if, if we want both of those, both of those uh, to be true, then the real definition must be based on something that we already knew, meaning that we must already have uh, proper knowledge of the parts of of, of the real definition. So a definition is worthless if we don't understand the terms uh, included in. And the only new thing in a, in a definition can be the way in which we put, the, put those terms together, or perhaps the fact that they are put together in this way. But any of the terms itself, uh, on their own, we should, we should uh, know before we can know the definition. So those are the, the four, four sort of criteria, sort of what the uh, posits for a real definition. Right, right. So maybe now we can, yeah, just to sum up the argument. So like, <clears throat> so I think, you know, Gavardi's thesis is that real definition isn't possible, although he accepts, you know, I guess he accepts the possibility of a nominal definition as well as like a descriptive definition. Um, so maybe we should talk on what the difference between those are. But at any rate, yeah, would you want to give like a brief overview of some of his critique of real definition? I don't know if, if there's a particular argument you'd want to uh, emphasize or just um, however you want to do it. But yeah, what, what is exactly his, um, why is he skeptical about real definition? Right. So I, I've found three, or three, three distinct ar uh, arguments against real definition. One is metaphysical, two are epistemological. Uh, the metaphysical argument, one of the epistemological arguments are, I think, quite straightforward. So the metaphysical argument, I sort of already hinted at it. It's basically quite simple. Definitions have a structure. Essences, according to Suhrawardi, don't have uh, a corresponding metaphysical structure. And so there, 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 can, there can never be correspondence between the, the real definition and the, the essence that we want to define. And so one of the criteria of 
of real definition uh, is is that we have metaphysical reasons for thinking that 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 uh, that criterion is never met. Uh, the first epistemological argument, uh, also quite straightforward, as I said, uh, he basically says, Suhrawardi says that, that uh, we don't really have a reliable means of making sure that any sort of candidate for a real definition includes all the constitutive parts. There's always the possibility that we're missing one of, let's say, one of the differentiating factors, for instance. And if, as, as, as Suhrawardi thinks, Peripatetics hold. If real definitions are to be foundational for science, this means that 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 the very foundation of our science uh, is bound to remain fallible. There's no way for us to make sure that 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 that, that foundation is secure. And and so what he thinks that this is simply inconsistent with the optimistic claims that 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 the peripatetics have. So th those are two arguments. Uh, the second metaphys uh, sorry, epistemological argument is perhaps slightly more convoluted, but, but I, I guess we can try to make sense of, of it here. Uh, we should probably start from the, 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 the fact that, that, that uh, one of the criteria for real definitions, maybe the fact that, that, that they must be exclusive to the thing defined. Now for Suhrawardi, this means that at least one of the constitutive terms must be unique to the essence that is being defined. And this unique uh, part is, is always the lowest differential part. So in the case of our definition of the human, uh, rational must be something that, that you only find uh, in, in, in human beings. Uh, another criterion, as we remember, was that the constitutive part should be better known than, than the, what, what is being defined. Now, Suhrawardi asks, how, how could we possibly know the differential part that only exists in the things that we want to define uh, before we know what, what, what is the thing uh, that we're trying to define? We can't learn it from anywhere else than the, than, than the very thing that we're trying to define. There's no way we could, we could come upon rationality in, in, in any other creatures than, than human beings, for instance. Uh, this means according to Suhrawardi, that at best, uh, the, uh, that constituent, the, the, the lowest differentia, can be as well known as the species it is supposed to define. But this then means that the real definition doesn't really yield us any new knowledge of the definendum, because we already knew the definendum when we, uh, when we come to have the definition, simply because we, can, we can't, we by acquiring the differentia, we necessarily uh, already acquire the definition. There's, there's this, this better known than uh, criterion can never be can never be met. So it's a it's a rather perhaps a rather more technical argument, but I but I, but I hope I managed to clarify it to, at least to some extent. But it's common to all of these arguments is that that Suhrawardi is really trying to uh, base them explicitly on, 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 on the criteria of real definition, which he seems to think are, you know, agreed upon by, 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 by everyone who, who endorses a theory of science based on, based on real definition. So in that sense, he's sort of trying to play according to the rules of, of, of the Avicennian theory of science and trying to show that, that, that actually it's, it's inconsistent or it, or it, or it fails to meet its own, or, how should I put it? The, the demands it sets for science are impossible, impossible to me. And, and so, um, so even though he you know, thinks that real definition is impossible, that doesn't mean, you know, philosophical inquiry is uh, finished because one thing we can do, nominal definition, which I guess is just kind of like analytic explanation, of what we mean by a term. And also, like you mentioned earlier, we can also do definitions where we kind of describe the common features, the features that we typically find in association with um, the human being. Uh, so it's not right, so it's not the philosophy is just put in our right? so we, we, There's still some things to do, right? So. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And 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 Suhrawardi also thinks that 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 some concepts that we have 
uh, we simply fail to to uh, to to ignore them once we come across uh, their instantiations. So, for instance, I mean, very basic uh, perception concepts like black, white, uh, let's say triangle, square, something like that. I mean, we we uh, okay. The geometrical forms might be might be perhaps different because. Those are those are a special case because we can define them. But let's say a concept like body, for instance, um, or, or or color concepts like black and white. I mean, once we once once we see black, we immediately know what black is, and and all we need to 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 learn, let's say the term black is is by having an ostensive definition. Someone points at a black object and says, "This is what I call black." Okay, that's what black is. There's nothing nothing we sh we could learn from. So that's something that, that there are certain concepts then that can get us started. And also uh, some of these Yatibari concepts that, that, that uh, talk quite a bit uh, in the book. Uh, Surodi thinks that those two are, I mean, we, we, there's no sort of, we don't have to go through the trouble of trying to define them. As long as, as soon as we, we, we acquire the, those, those concepts, we acquire them. Uh, in, 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 in the right way, we have to acquire the proper concept. So, so there, there is there, there are starting points for, for for doing philosophical research, for doing empirical research. But I think at the same time, uh, what this critique of real definition results is that that that, that to some extent, uh, Surawardi's theory of science. I mean, there's so I would say in, in 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 basic outline, it's 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 very very similar to 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 Avicenna's or, or Aristotle's theory of science. It's only more modest in its uh, in its sort of uh, epistemological claims. Uh, so so uh, when we give let's say when we give a a nominal definition of human being by 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 means of the primarily by means of the perceptual properties that 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 that, that we 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 grasp in a human being. Uh, we can never be. I mean, we 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 shouldn't believe that we somehow penetrate the essence of humanity. All we do is we're trying to explain some perceivable properties by means of other perceivable properties, and ultimately the the decision of which properties we take to be uh, de definitive of, of of human being depends. Precisely on the fact, okay, uh, which pro which set of properties has the greatest explanatory power? So if if if, if let's say properties A and B uh, can be crowded in properties C and D, but not the other way around, then C and D should clearly be in our definition, and A and B should be uh, properties that we explain by means of, of of that definition. So so in that sense, yes, he 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 he. Uh, Continues to think that 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 not only philosophy but also sort of empirical science based on philosophy is uh, is a is a is a genuinely valid and and and, and worthwhile uh, endeavor. But but he just doesn't think that 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 we should uh, lay as much hopes on it as 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 some of the predecessors did. So. I guess another way to put it would be that there's a certain gap between his metaphysics and his theory of science. What he says, I mean, the metaphysical framework that he lays out in the in the Hikmatulishrak is really, really far removed from from any kind of science that 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 we could do on the basis of of definitions. Uh, and he says that 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 we, we we can never know the details of this metaphysical story that he presents. The best we can do. In terms of knowing, sort of having more detailed knowledge of of the world, is by continuing to, continuing to do to do to do science more or less according to the very pathetic model. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, um, Justin, did you have a question? Did you want to? Okay. Yeah, I guess I was just curious. My background is in art history and sort of intellectual history, and I was wondering if. Questions of visual signs are part of Suhrvardi's thought, and whether, like the cloud signals rain, you know, sort of classical example that a lot of Byzantine writers talk about this as, you know, like a natural sign, and 
what we would call arbitrary sign, which may be sort of not fair to raise this question in in the medieval period or pre-modern period. But I wondered if if in all of his thinking about light, he stumbles upon the question or discusses or has reflections on the status of visual signs and whether or not they may pick out, like geometry would be a very classical example where it seems that the form or the shape tells you something taps into the metaphysical structure of the universe and there very clearly that you just sort of see that the triangle is the least sided polygon and it, and it and it conveys something true metaphysically about the world um, or reality perhaps yeah that's a that's an interesting question um i i, I brings to mind a couple of things which might lead a bit to a, to a slightly different direction than what you're what you're aiming at I, so so i don't recall seeing seeing cases where 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 he would sort of where he would take let's say certain perceivable properties as signs of something something uh let's say imperceptible in 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 that sense or as uh, let's say a uh, or, or or a sign of something 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 that's uh, something some other perceptible thing that's not uh, that doesn't appear itself but that could be inferred let's say from from what does appear. Uh, I don't think he. I, I think he would definitely you know recognize these some of these cases like your your case of a cloud, a dark cloud uh, being a sign for for a rain that is soon to come. Uh, I, do, I I'm, I'm sure he would he would be happy with that but but. I haven't come across those kinds of cases uh, sort of pay, playing any significant role in his in his uh, theory of science. On the other hand, he there, there what one aspect that I don't really talk uh, much about in the book is is uh, is what he what, what what he says about about the imaginations and uh, and things like you know veridical dreams. And there there I think he he to some extent engages with the question of. Of, of how, for instance, symbols work, and how something we see in a in a in a veridical dream can can denote something quite quite different once we have the key of of, of interpreting that dream. That's definitely that, uh, and that's that's an aspect in him that that Corbin made much about, and that uh, that some of the later um, um, commentators made 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 much of, and perhaps that's also of some interest to to an art historian. Uh, like yourself, this 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 idea that that certain uh, perceptual features could stand for 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 other 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 features, perhaps even uh, imperceptible features. But uh, to cut a long long answer short, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, I I I don't really see these these this this sort of phenomenon, this visual sign or perceptual sign phenomenon, playing. Uh, much of a role in his in his theory of science, uh, but 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 there are you know I, I've, there there are um, parts of his logical works that I've I've sort of skimmed through. I haven't painstakingly read uh, read uh, read. I haven't read each chapter with the same painstaking attention as I have read some chapters. So it's perfectly possible that I've missed something something of interest that could be elaborated on. On in this regard, but definitely the the uh, you know what it says about imagination, dreams, and and to some extent also things like uh, uh, mystical visions. I mean that 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 might be an interesting avenue for further research on these lines. Thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Justin. Um, and maybe we can move now to the um, Itibari concepts. Um, so. You mentioned that this is one of the more famous features of Surabhadra's philosophy. Um, maybe the most famous feature of the critical portion of his um, philosophy. And uh, maybe before we get into the arguments for his position on the Itibara concepts, can you just kind of give us a sense of what exactly is Surabhadra's thesis here? And then, I don't know if you, you provide a lot of really interesting historical background uh, 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 for his. So, I want to. Any of okay, so so just to get uh, there was a, a bit of a sort of noise in the uh, 
in, in our connection. You, you, you want me to tell about that historical background or you don't want me to? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mainly, you know, what is the thesis? That's you know, what exactly is the thesis there. And yeah, I want to get to some of the historical background. That would be interesting too. Because, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, so the um, maybe I'll start with a brief account of the background. So the the 12th century debate about these Yatibari concepts. So concept we could perhaps call them concepts that are to use uh, later Latin terminology, sort of mere beings of reason, something that 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 our mind postulates without these concepts having having a, a distinct correlate uh, in the experimental reality. So, so this debate uh, emerges largely within the Abyssinian tradition. And it's, it's most of the sort of uh, stage has been set when, uh, when Surawardi joins the debate. He, he's by no means an initiator of this discussion. He doesn't invent the debate. And many of the arguments that he uses are inherited from, from prior thinkers. Uh, but I think... What makes him interesting, he, he takes the debate extremely seriously. He spends uh, dozens and dozens of pages on it, and he tries to come up with an alternative metaphysical system that is not vulnerable uh, to, to the Abyssinian theory, or that is not vulnerable to this critique against the, uh, the, the, the Abyssinian theory, that these, uh, these, the aspects that, that these uh, arguments target. Uh, the crucial background to this debate is uh, Avicenna's distinction between essence and existence, which he makes in, uh, in, in all of his metaphysical works. And it's ab the distinction is absolutely fundamental to his metaphysics. Basically, any metaphysical topic that he discusses, it's somehow there in the background. And then in, in his famous proof for, for God's existence, it, it really relies on, on, on this distinction. The, the discussion concerning the Atibarat, it, it does concern a number of other topics as well. It's not confined to essence and existence, but, but, but this is really the starting point. And perhaps we can focus on these two here. Um, now, before Suhrawardi, uh, uh, Avicenna student, Bahman Yar, Bahman Yar ibn Marzupan, who died in sometime around in, in the 1060s, so... so uh, a little more than 100 years before Surawardi. Uh, Balmunyar at least explicitly presents an interpretation of Avicenna in which essence and existence are really distinct. They're sort of metaphysical parts of any existing thing, any existing thing apart from God. God is, the, God is an exception here, but anything apart from God, you have a metaphysical building block of essence and you have a metaphysical building block of existence. You, these two are put together in the existing thing. Now. Some others were quite quick to point out, and, and, and I think the earliest author to do this is the mathematician and the poet uh, Omar Khayyam in a, in a couple of short treatises that, that he wrote in the, in the early uh, 12th century. Uh, Khayyam points out that, that this sort of uh, interpretation of Avicenna seems to entail a problematic infinite regress. And this is a, an argument that Suhrawadi also applies time and again in his critique of the Atibara. So if we think that a thing, an existing thing, exists by virtue of having existence added or appended to its essence, then surely we must also say that this existence must exist in order to be appendable to the thing's essence in the first place. And of course, in this, for, for this existence to exist, it must have existence, the second order existence in turn, must exist and so you get the get the drift. Uh, so so yeah, this is this is uh, this is sort of what is central argument as well. Uh, and I'm, I, I tried to argue in the book that 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 this debate about the Atibarat is one of the central reasons for why Suhrawardi tries to develop a monistic metaphysics that doesn't have such a relation. Uh, in, in, at its foundation, a relation between essence and existence. So, so he, he he thinks that the culprit for for this problem is 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 sort of a metaphysical theory that is pluralistic, uh, or at least dualistic uh, at its foundation. And, and by 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 trying to avoid that starting point, Surawardi he thinks he can avoid uh, this critique of the Atibara. Of course, he may come across other problems, but arguably. We can say that the, the, the infinite regress 
generated by the antibody, by the assumption that the antibody concepts have real correlates. And that regress, regress is not one of the problems he has to, has to face. Great. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, the, so you said the prime motivation for the monism, and hopefully we'll be able to get into that, is the criticism of basically Avicenna confusing what are re merely beings, concepts that are merely beings of reason with concepts that actually have real extramental correlates like black or white. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, um, so I was just thinking maybe just uh, so basically, I guess the thesis is that there's a number of significant metaphysical concepts in Avicenna: existence, and unity, substance, accident, the metaphysical concepts like possibility and possibility and support. For all those concepts, there's no real experimental counterpart concept, and. So before we get in, you already touched on the key argument, the regress argument. But before we, have, we kind of talk a little bit more, maybe um, I was thinking, you know, as a warm up, like, are there for people that might find that surprising that existence doesn't have a external count, uh, counterpart? Um, what would be some like concepts that are more obviously, like upon reflection, everyone can kind of agree are mere beings of reason? So. I was thinking maybe color or length, but yeah, I just was wondering, you know, it seems like as a preparation for this position, you know, we can think about what are some more ordinary concepts that are kind of clearly beings of reason. Yeah, that's that's tricky. Uh, by this stage, I'm not sure that, that there are really oh, genuinely okay. uncontroversial <laughs> okay. cases, right? Okay, at least okay. I don't yeah. really trust my own intuitions in this in, in this matter. Perhaps it's because I've, 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 I've been trying to deal with these arguments for such a long time. Uh, one could say, and I've, I think I've used this in, in somewhere in the past, one might say that number, for instance, is a, is a good candidate. At least if we think that, that any arbitrary set of, let's say, three things constitutes an instance of threeness. So let's say, uh, you know, that book on the top of the pile here, let's say the last eyelash that 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 you lost from your left eye uh, and, uh, uh, I don't know, Donald Trump's uh, toupee. If those things uh, constitute a set of threeness or, or a set that, that instantiates threeness, it seems like, uh, okay, was, was that threeness there really, really there before we did the counting? It seems funny to think that it would be. And obviously it would, it would, result in uh or it would uh explode the number of things that that <laughs> quite literally that 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 there are uh in the world so so yeah perhaps there might be cases like that but uh but not even that is uncontroversial and Avicenna, for instance thought that 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 numbers really exist in reality so <laughs> it's gotcha. tricky gotcha okay um, yeah, so maybe like I mean, you already kind of went through the regress argument, um, but yeah, maybe we could just highlight that again. This is kind of the core, um, the core argument for the Itibari concepts uh, not having real correlates. And then I don't know if you want to touch on maybe we, you, you divide regress arguments into two. You see that, um, the simple regress argument focuses on one. Itibari concept and then mixed form involves two uh, Itibari concepts. And maybe we can just talk about simple regress. Really. I mean, we already kind of touched on it. But so yeah. Like so I guess we could generalize from what I said about existence and essence by saying that that um, the we we assume that that an Itibari concept has a real correlate, then we can always uh, predicate the same. Uh, concept of the same property of of the property that we postulated. So in this case, we we can we can uh, predicate existence of existence, and then there's no stop. Then, then there's no no end to this. So in this sense, any of the any of the Atibari concepts, if we assume that it's that it that it has reality, then then uh, it results in this regress. The, the 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 mixed variant is 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 very similar. Only here you work with two. Or perhaps more more concepts. We could take 
unity and existence, for example. Anything, any, for instance, this pen here, this is, uh, this is one because it has unity, according to someone who's a realist about the Yatibara. Uh, now, the, the, the pen's unity must exist. So, so the unity must have existence. Now, in order to, for that existence to be the existence of the unity of this pen, then it must be one and distinct existence. It must be an existence that dif that's different, let's say, from the from the uh, mm. from the existence of the cup that I have here on the table. And also, it can only be such by virtue of having a unity. And so, we we wow. get the, the the mixed redress uh, running. Perhaps you can do that with with three, or perhaps even even more. Uh, 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 you know, but then the, the the idea would be the same. You predicate uh, these the the, the atibari concepts that you with which you you uh, uh, generate the the, uh, the the regress. You predicate them from each other, and at a certain point, you have a loop that, that is so, so, so for, regressive. So the, for the pencil to have unity, there already has to be this one pencil that can gain this property of unity is that and then we or in order for the pencil to to the argument would be if the pencil is one if it's one pencil because it has unity yeah. then the unity must in, in order for the pencil to have unity the unity must exist but the existence of the unity must also be one because it belongs to this particular unity so the existence must have unity right. in turn and of course for that unity to belong to existence it must exist and, and, and so forth. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, fascinating. Um, so uh, maybe I was thinking, I was trying to think what would be, I don't know what you think is the most kind of common objection to reading these concepts as um, being barred. But um, I mean, you mentioned realist objection. So maybe I can just read what we say here. So, Realist says that if existence, unity, contingency, and other such attributes were mere concepts with no experimental correlates, what conditions beyond the modern attribute could we find for the truth? In other words, the use of such, such concepts would be entirely arbitrary. So, yeah. So, how would um, yeah, how would sort of already respond to that kind of objection? That if you know, if it's, if it's a mere being of reason, then it seems like we would just be allowed to indiscriminately attribute you know unity or existence to whatever we we felt like i guess yeah 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 so everybody recognizes this this uh this objection um and 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 he in in in, in dealing with this objection uh he, he he clearly also i mean the way in which he tries to deal with i think uh belies the fact that that he 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 holds Yatibari concepts to be indispensable to our thinking. And and and, and he recognizes that an anti-realist like himself must be able to come up with an account of of, of the truth of statement for, for statements that include the Yatibari concepts. Now in my interpretation, I I or in my solution, I take I take it that he he is trying to present uh, sort of a two-tiered Account of truth. So there are two 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 ways for for uh, concepts or propositions, including concepts, to be true. Now, simple species concepts like black, white, human, horse, they are true because they have real truth makers. So there are black things. There are blacks. There are whites. There are humans. There are horses out there in reality. And and whenever we use these kinds of concepts in, in, in statements about reality, the truth of those statements is determined by, by, by the way in which those truth makers exist or do not exist in, in reality. So here we have straightforward correspondence. Uh, by contrast, the Atibari concepts uh, are true, not of things out there in the world, but of this kind of first order concepts. And they're true of the experimental world only by by first being true of these, these first order concepts. So for instance, if we take uh, a genus concept like color, uh, we should understand it as primarily predicated of the concept black that we have. And by virtue of the fact that the concept black can correspond to black things in the world, 
color too can correspond to 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 things in the world, and so we can conceive of those things as you know not just being black but as being colored, and in this respect similar to let's say white things. So 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 this is how he tries to deal with it. I think uh, uh, it's a perhaps it's a potentially um, workable solution, but for, but Suhrawardi really doesn't develop it very far. He he just says that that in each of these first order concepts that we have, uh, there must be some something in them. He he, he uses the term khusus, which we could translate as simply you know it's a very vague term some some property or some 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 feature in them that that makes uh the attribution of some yatibari concept uh valid but but the attribution of another concept invalid so for instance if we have the concept black color can be validly predicated of it but uh let's say um triangularity cannot is uh, or, or 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 what's a better example let's say Smell is not validly predicated of, uh, of, of, of of black. Why is that the case? Well, the best he can come up with is he say, well, there's something in the black, some khusu, some property that makes uh, color valid but smell invalid. But that's of course, it's perhaps a start for a starting point for an answer, but it's not a not a genuine answer. So in that sense, uh, things are let, left, uh, you know, slightly. Uh, unfinished here, but I think it's it's what is in, interesting and important is that he really he he takes this objection seriously. He tries to start developing an answer, and he he clearly thinks that the critique of Yatibari concepts doesn't mean that we should try to uh, let's say build a philosophical system entirely without them. Uh, but 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 we should we should be careful uh, of of what we take. How, how we account for 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 the truth and for the truth of propositions that 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 uh, propositions that include them. Right. So yeah. So it's not as though he would say that you know um, using the predicate X exists is always false. It's not as though you know you're you're speaking falsely if you say this pen exists. It's just that. It's not true in virtue of like the the correspondence theory of truth. That's not really um, the way of explaining how it's true. Instead, it has to do with it connecting properly to the first order uh, concepts. Like, is that the way of putting? Yeah, it? I think you you nailed it there. Perhaps, perhaps I mean. Maybe there might be a way for for accounting. Okay, what is it that makes, let's say, existence uh, attributable to this pen that I hold here, and not, let's say, uh, to another pen uh, next to it that that would be, let's say, red. There's no red pen here, so right. I can't attribute existence to it. Uh, perhaps there. I mean, perhaps a, a story that 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 that. That would be sort of more complete, more full. Uh, can, could be uh, presented along the lines of, of, of what he says, and then I think it would have to be something where uh, existence is not simply. We, we don't think that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a a property that a metaphysical thing. Uh, sorry, a, a property that a thing in the experimental world. Has that is distinct, metaphysically distinct from the thing, but instead something that we attribute to the thing by virtue of perhaps comparing the thing to a number of uh, number of other uh, mm. things that we are or are aware of, or perhaps things that we the, that we do not perceive but imagine, or something like that. So, so in that sense, there might be a psychological story uh, for our forming. Some of these concepts, let's say the concept of existence, and once we're clear about the, that psychological story, uh, we can make sense of the of what what existence means, and then perhaps we can say, okay, there's something we can perhaps say say a bit more about what is the property in this pen pencil that 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 uh, that 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 our concept of it makes uh, attributing existence to it valid. But 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 yeah, as I said, he. 
we we don't really have that story in his in his uh, in his works. Fascinating. Awesome. Okay. Um, if we, um, with our, we have like minutes or so left to make. We can now turn finally to the uh, uh, to his positive system, illuminationism, and um, maybe we can start with his novel vocabulary. So, uh, kind of the, the central concepts are light and appearing. And rather than like substance, accidents, existence. So, yeah, could you kind of give us a sense of what is light in appearing and why are those the central uh, concepts? Right. So I think there, there, there might be sort of a, I mean, his, his choice of, 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 of the concept of light as foundational, I think that might, there might be some historical reasons behind that. And I, Discuss some of those in the book. I mean, there's there are Quranic precedents for 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 light. In the Quran, we have this famous light verse, uh, where which which says that God is light, and somehow uh, all the other things that exist are are also light, but in uh, in sort of a diminishing degrees. Mm-hmm. So that was certainly in the background. Avicenna has an interpretation of this light verse, which which Surah Wadi was no doubt familiar. With, and, and and that probably also plays into it. And then Ghazali, Abu Hamid Ghazali, the, whom we know as a critic of philosopher, also has an interesting uh, work uh, called Mishkatul Anwar, which is which is really basically uh, philosophical emanation theory uh, in, a, in a in a sort of a symbolic form. And and he makes use of of, of the concept of light in in much the much the same way as as, as Surawati does. So there clearly is this this sort of background, uh, and I'm I'm, I'm sure he th- those are some of the reasons why he opted for this term. But I I I, I want to claim in the book that that there's also something something else, and and, and this would be the fact that light and appearing, nur and zuhur are both terms that are suggestive of something or that denote something where in which being is identical with being known so 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 it's it, it's uh so if if light or appearing are the foundational terms then it seems that in the very foundation of our metaphysics we're dealing with something that is uh um um oh, un, 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 Indistinct from 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 being known or from from some kind of awareness, uh, some kind of consciousness, perhaps. So I, I think that's that's one of the one of the crucial crucial aspects for his for his uh, choosing these terms. Uh, it, it makes uh, makes uh, makes the concepts quite useful for for his monistic aspirations. On the on the other hand, of course, you could say that 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 light and appearing involve being known, but then there's also another use. Of, of I would say both terms where where being known is not, or or at least the uh, the light or the appearing itself being aware of itself is not entailed. So we could say that that this pen here appears to me without thereby meaning that the pen pen is uh, is is in any way knowledgeable or aware of itself. And we could say, speaking of physical light, for instance, saying that it's light without it thereby. Uh, being illuminated to itself or being visible to itself. So, so in that sense, I think these are these are terms that are malleable enough for for Zohar what is purposes. And certainly, I think also the fact that 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 they didn't come up with as much sort of prior philosophical baggage that 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 uh, let's say the the technical terms in in in. In mainstream Abyssinism came with that that might also have been have been useful for him. So those might be some of the reasons why he why he coins the term uh, or why he adopts the term. Let's say he, he didn't really invent the term, obviously. Uh, when it comes to what what light is uh, in his in his thought, I think we have to really pay close attention to how he begins the the the, the, the second the positive part of the of the Hikmat of Israel. He begins that by characterizing characterizing light and 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 there do there, thereby he he uh he 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 does that by recourse to to our experience of of being self-aware subjects of ex, uh of, of self-aware cognitive subjects and self-aware agents uh 
And this is clearly the foundation for, for, for his concepts. And therefore, it, it's, it's, it, it, it has to be understood as, as something that's, that's not reducible to anything like vis visual light or anything, anything of that sort. By contrast, I would say that visual light is, is a derivative phenomenon for superlight. It amounts to something that, that, that has to be explained by, by this more, more foundational light that, that he characterizes by means of, of self-awareness or self-consciousness. So, yeah, I guess that's a, I mean, this was the, one of the trickiest part of the book to, to write. How do I introduce this new vocabulary without, you know, without as much uh, sort of uh, verbal hand waving as I'm doing now, <laughs> but, but still, you know, uh, trying to bring out the novelty in Suhra what is thought. So not, not, not trying to sort of, also not trying to reduce it too quickly to to to, right. to anything that that let's say Avis now some 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 other predecessor of what his would have would have said. Yeah. And maybe I really want to look at your diagram and and because your you know your explanation of the con the key concepts are, is really helpful. So maybe I can share my screen um, in a moment. But I just wanted to ask just kind of. Um, you know, you, you have an earlier book on self-awareness and Islamic philosophy, and you do engage with Suravarti there. I mean, is that kind of why you became so interested in Suravarti? Because place self-awareness as like um, kind of the fundamental metaphysical concept, I guess. Is that kind of how you got into them? Or? That probably plays a role there. I think uh, one, of the, one of the key things is that when I was doing the research for that book, I, I, I just, you know, I noticed that the, 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 the sort of the pile of notes under the folder, really interesting stuff in Suhra, what it just kept increasing. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I came across these, these really exciting ideas, arguments. And, and I guess at some point I, I just, it was, it was an obvious sort of, question can i make sense of all this is there is there a system underlying all of these notes and and in that sense it sort of grew naturally from it but i'm sure that the 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 the, the really the central role that he so for abyssinia as interesting and, and novel as his remarks about self-awareness are it's still a largely a psychological phenomenon for him yeah but Zuhra, what he really gives it a much more central role he really takes it as a building block of his metaphysical system and of course that's that's exciting if you if you're working on a particular topic or a particular phenomenon, and someone then comes and says, "Okay, right. this is actually what we should start with," obviously that's uh, that's exciting and, and, and interesting. Right. Awesome. So yeah, you just bring up the diagram, um, and then um, you see that. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. I don't. Know if you want to describe? Um, so pure light, I guess. Going to be um, have to do with self awareness, especially. But yeah, you can kind of describe some of these terms and then also maybe relating it to the idea of monism. You may kind of touched on that, but like you said, you know, the uh, party is giving you a bonus system. How does that, how can we understand that in the context of the diagram? Sure. So, so. What we have to understand here is that that pure light is really the the, the only fundamental thing here. Uh, it's the it's 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 uh, the only thing that 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 uh, well let's put it this way: the, all the other things are in one way or another reducible to to, to pure light. Accidental light, for starters, is an, what what we could take as the external manifestation of a pure light, and thereby dependent on it. So pure light, we could say, is a cause of the Accidental light. I think this pair of concepts is is most relevant uh, when Surawadi is spelling out the relation between the Platonic forms, which he endorses, and their in individual instantiations. So the Platonic forms for him are pure lights, what he calls pure light, and and their instantiations are are accidental lights. So, for instance, uh, let's say the uh, uh, the Platonic form of, uh, of 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 the element fire. That is a pure light. It's sort of a, a form of fire thinking itself or aware of itself. And all the individual fires that we that we come across in the sublunary world, they are accident, they are they are sort of the extrinsic 
external activity of this form, which is no longer aware of itself or not does not appear to itself. It's not thinking itself. It, all it all it does is it's it's visible and perhaps tangible to 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 uh, other uh, percipient subjects in the, in the in the sublunary world. So that's a that's a that's an important difference between pure light and and and, and accidental light. Now, when it comes to 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 the dusky substance and the dark state, uh, in my interpretation of Suravarti, these two concepts uh, are should be understood as Yatibari concepts, and and that means that 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 they should not be taken to be things out there in experimental reality, but merely sort of entities, shall we say, in scarecrows, quotes that 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 only figure in our understanding of the world. I think Suhruwadi introduces these these uh, terms to primarily to make sure make sense of our understanding of individual substances here in the in the in the in the sublunary world. Individual substances as things which have first of all a diachronic identity, and secondly uh, a number of latent properties which may not presently appear at all, but which are sort of required for us to have the kind of understanding of these things that we have. So my example in the book is uh, is is I think it's uh, it, it, this example uh, that I always tend to use. It's something that comes from Avicenna. It's, for some reason, it's 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 horses. So if we think of an individual horse, for example, according to Suhraudi, we should understand it as an accidental light of the form of horseness, together with with other properties that enter into the bundle that constitutes the individual horse. Now, if we think of it in these terms, then at any moment, any present moment, any particular moment, uh, the the individual horse uh, really only appears at one way, and in this sense, it could be uh, its being is reducible to its appearance at that moment. So, if we see, let's say, a horse in the stable, that horse's performance in the racetrack does not appear to us at, at, in, in in any way. It's just the horse is there in the stable, perhaps eating some some hay. And, and taking a rest or something like that. But if we want to think, and, I, and Suravati thinks that in, there's a certain valid, uh, there, are, there are valid grounds for our thinking in this way. When we think that it is this resting individual that is also a fast runner once, it, once we bring him to the racetrack, then we have to introduce the concept of an individual substance with a diachronic identity and some latent properties. And this concept is the dusky substance and its its dark states, or perhaps these two concepts are are the substance and the and the, and the dark state. So so we could say that 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 to understand uh, things out there in the world as the kinds of individual substances we think they are, we need let's say the the immediately present perceivable content that that Suhrawardi calls accidental light, but we also need this, uh, this sort of conceptual aspect, which which uh, which is let's say our concept of, of substance and our concept of, of various latent or dark, not non, non apparent states, and barrier finally in this picture is what what we have when we bring these two aspects together, when we bring the accidental light together with 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 the conceptual content that we that we. Uh, through which we 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 consider or through which we understand that accidental light. And so the barrier is sort of the. It's a, I guess we could say, say that it's the it's the sort of the meeting point uh, of, of 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 these two aspects. It it, it doesn't have any any sort of uh, independent reality apart from from this. So that's my my account of these these sort of. Building blocks of of, of Suhrawardi's, uh, Suhrawardi's theory. So only one of them is strictly speaking uh, foundational here. The other aspects are either grounded in this in this foundational aspect. So accidental light is grounded in pure light, or they are are, are mind dependent concepts that that are needed to make sense of the world as it appears to us. Now this is no doubt controversial a controversial reconstruction, yeah. uh, and and. It remains to be seen how how other scholars will will receive it. I haven't really seen any reviews of the book. I haven't really seen any anyone uh, engage with with my suggestion seriously. Perhaps it will be proven wrong uh, in the in the in the future. I'm happy to 
see it proven wrong as long as, as, as the arguments are good and as long as the, 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 the whole discussion furthers our understanding of Suhra Wardi. I'm the first to admit that this is a, a rather speculative interpretation of some passage in Surah Wardi that are, we should, uh, I should uh, confess, very sketchy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would si- still say that that the that there's one virtue in my interpretation, and that's consistency. Uh, namely, Suhrawati, in these passages where he introduces this terminology, he adamantly he clearly says that 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 or he describes these dusky substances and dark states in exclusively negative terms. So he 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 says that they are ultimately kinds of non-existence. What does that mean? Well, my interpretation is that it, it means that they're not really out there in reality. They're only there in our minds and something that we add to uh, to, 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 to we add in we add to the way things appear in our experience of them or in our understanding of them. As Urawati also, I mean, bearing in mind that 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 he spent so much time in uh, in refuting the reality of precisely the kind of concepts like substance. It would be strange if then when he presents his uh, positive alternative, metaphysical alternative, he immediately introduces the very same substance as part of the right. building blocks of extramental reality. So, so I would say that, 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 that my interpretation has the virtue of, of being able to uh, bear in mind, as it were, the, the critique of the Atibara that we just uh, just read a, a, a few pages before in the in the Hikmatullah talk, and also making sense of the fact that Suhrawati thinks that these are uh, negative, somehow negative or non-existent items. So again, yeah. sorry, it's a long long answer, but that's a that I'm not sure how helpful that diagram is, but it, it really puts a lot of metaphysical <laughs> uh, material in a in a in a in a little less than a half page. Yeah. Well, so would you say that you kind of explain why why dusky substance, the, you know, is, which uses the concept of substance, uh, is that kind of one of maybe one of the more difficult interpretive or maybe the most difficult interpretive aspect that you found explaining how is it odd for him to include dusky substance when he's just critiqued Substance as itibarat, um, that's the right way of putting it. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, I mean, he 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 reintroduces it uh, as something that is needed to make sense of the way in which we understand the world of sublunary things. So, the world uh, in which things yeah. like you and me, uh, pencils, cups. Horses, <laughs> what not exist. We we understand these. We 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 cannot understand. Let's say the individual horse uh, as a continuity of uh, manifestation that comes from, or, or, or sorry, appearance that comes from from the, the the pure light that is the form of horses. We are our, our, our sort of understanding simply doesn't function in that way. We are. We could say that our Let's say the temporal scope of our experience is 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 much narrower. We have to rely on memory. The memory doesn't really uh, make the past states of of the of 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 that individual entity appear in the same way as as its present state. So the best we can do to make sense of the con- continuity is is to apply is by applying concepts like like substance. So in that sense, it's there. It's it's needed. These kinds of concepts are needed to make sense of the world the way we do, but they're not. We we shouldn't assume that 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 because of this they are part of the metaphysical makeup of okay. of of the extramental world. So so that's that that crucial step. Saying that, by the way, when I introduce substance, I only mean that that that, that it's needed in the way things appear to us or in the way that we understand things. That's <laughs> what Surawati doesn't say. And that's a huge speculative leap from me to say that that this is this is the sort of the warrant under which he he reintroduces the concept. But 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 yeah I've I've let myself or given myself some some freedom or liberty here uh uh you know uh, on the grounds of, of of the consistency of my my interpretation, I think it 
it would make Suhra what we, and also, you know, charitability to Suhra, because I think precisely as you said, if he simply reintroduced substances after that, that, that critique, it wouldn't, he would be a rather poor philosopher, an inconsistent right. thinker. Right, right. Great. Well, I want to be sensitive to time. Do you think I could ask just one more question um, before we finish? I just wanted to, or maybe just flag, um, so you kind of, so you kind of describe how the you say how the, the primary motivation for the monism is the critique of the itibari uh, itibari concepts, and then just say how you know then the course we we don't we were able to talk about it too much. You mentioned, but the whole idea of platonic forms. Um, it seems like it, your your interpretation that the primary motivation for that is the monism. So I don't know if, if you just you don't mind quickly. Can you give us a sense of why why would the monism kind of fit nicely with uh, this position of our platonic forms? So again, there was a bit of noise. So so oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So your question concerns the platonic forms in particular, how they help in in monism, or what's the question? Why why Suhravati? wants to endorse monism in the first place no yeah more so uh the former so yeah just, just okay yeah can we just talk about like why is it that um how is it that monism sort of leads him in the direction of of platonic forms yeah right right so yeah uh, that's a that's a good question i think i think so what the, um, i mean the, the the way in which it works is that so what they thought that that this allows him i mean the the, the way in which he the kind of model of emanation that he builds, he thinks that that it allows him to make sense of how the forms are grounded in in uh, in the one light, which is God for him, uh, that is the source of everything. So 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 he thinks that there's this 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 uh, this differentiation, this exponential differentiation differentiation that that starts from from one principle and and. Obviously, he doesn't think that he can give the full story, but he thinks that that it's uh, it's a model that's uh, rich enough to to have room for 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 things like 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 the forms. So it's a it's a very sort of sketchy account again, but 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 still it's a it's a, it's a way for the the forms and the model and the and the the model of the emanation model. Give him the means of 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 of, of producing essences, uh, this differences between the essences of things to, to 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 something that's one to begin with. And here, I think there's a there's a there's a major difference uh, from 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 Ab Avicenna. For Avicenna, he's also an emanation theorist, but uh, but 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 essences are are difficult to fit in, particularly essences of of, of sublunary things. Are difficult to fit in to his system. I think there are two ways in which we could proceed, both of which uh, have their problems. We could we could first of all say that once we reach, uh, once we come sort of down enough on the on the on the on the scale of emanation, we reach the the sublunary world, and it ha it has one intellectual principle. What Abyssinia calls the giver of forms or or, or or the active intellect. And that is supposed to contain all the essences itself, and then emanate them to to uh, to, to to particular places in the in the in the sublunary world, depending on the, the sort of the material preparation for 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 each form. Now the problem here is that Avicenna really doesn't have the means of explaining how come suddenly once we reach the active intellect. The, the amount of, of, of essences simply explodes. Before that, it's it's a very neat system. Each celestial, each of the sort of the prior intellects, uh, sort of it's uh, it, it has one essence with with uh, a, a limited number of sort of internal aspects. But suddenly, once we reach the active intellect, the number of internal aspects, the number of essences, just explodes. And Avicenna has no explanation for that. So there would be inexplicable elements in this metaphysics. Another way to, to, to understand Avicenna is to say that actually the essences are not produced uh, in the emanation, in, in the process of emanation at all. They're there to begin with. And, and God's, the sense in which God creates them 
is that he chooses which of them uh, receive existence and which don't. But that, of course, is it's it's also inexplicable how were or why were the essences there to begin with. Uh, Avicenna would have no explanation for that, and it would also be scandalous from the perspective of accounting for 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 creation, because Avicenna wanted to have a. He didn't really succeed on this. Uh, many theologians took him to task for this, but he clearly wanted to have. I think he clearly wanted to have uh, an account of creation that is true to to the Muslim revelation. So there's an omnipotent God who's responsible for everything that exists. But in this model, obviously, he would only be responsible for the existence part of existing things. The essence part would be co completely, you know, God could not do anything about them. They're not really created by God. God only gives things existence. So uh, I'm not sure if this is Avicenna's view, but it's clear that, that many people in the later tradition took this to be uh, the, the sort of the peripatetic view, the view that essences are not created. That would be the peripatetic view. And interestingly, many authors in this in the later tradition took Suhrawardi to have precisely the opposite view, namely that essences are created. And this, if we bring this in mind, then, then perhaps we can say that there was a theological motive as well. So to, the monist motive would right. be one, then a theological mo uh, motive would be another for Suhrawardi to, to, uh, to, to endorse the form. So, so this would be a way of accounting for how essences uh, are, are are really part of the same sort of emanationist framework that uh, emana framework of a model of emanation that is supposed to 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 make okay these are not his terms but that are supposed to make things existing so essence is an existing existence they although he doesn't endorse these terms but if we wanted to use those terms we could say that both of them come within the same package. Wonderful. Um, well, I want to I want to you know, go too long you know, over nine minutes. So um, thanks a lot, Yard, for coming. Um, it's really it's, I I found it to be an absolutely fascinating book. Um, as Jane said, you know, it's a very it's an illuminating you know illuminating discussion. So um, thanks so much for uh, coming, Yari, and uh, you know I wish you best of luck with your. Uh, um, oh yeah, what are you working on? You mentioned that you're not. Um, Working on sort of are you uh, presently, but is, do you, would you mind mentioning what you're uh, currently dealing with? Uh, so yeah, I, I have a I have a, a team here uh, in, in 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 my university. We're basically working on Avicenna's metaphysics and its reception, but we're also trying to bring it to uh, to uh, to terms with with certain di discussions in contemporary analytic metaphysics. So we're trying to. Continue our historical work, but also build some bridges to to to, to contemporary philosophy. So, so that is, is is occupying me mostly these days. A number of papers on Avicenna that I'm trying to finish, and perhaps a book on Avicenna's metaphysics uh, in the future as well.